Hello and welcome to the Sheldrake Vernon Dialogues with myself Mark Vernon and Rupert Sheldrake. Hello Mark. We get together and talk about something that we've been reading about, researching about, thinking about. It's quite spontaneous and the idea is that we have a conversation that we hope then uh, elicits thoughts in yourselves and maybe even um, suggests conversations to have elsewhere and see where it goes, where these themes take us. And this morning, Rupert, I wanted about talking um, around the notion of subtle energies. Mm. Um, it's, it's come up for me quite specifically because in psychotherapy um, at the moment, there's quite a lot of even becoming mainstream interest in this area. And it's coming in through practices like EMDR, um, which is used for the treatment of trauma, eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. It's when you use fingers in front of someone's eyes, for example, whilst they're holding a memory of something to shift how that memory kind of sits inside them. And um, there's good evidence, which is why NICE and other bodies in the UK are now proving it, that it nice helps. NICE meaning so, National Institute for Clinical, Clinical Excellence. Excellence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that the kind of, you know, the authorised body for proving these things. Um, uh, it, you know, it supports the evidence that it does help trauma shift in people. And trauma in psychotherapy means an experience that may be particular or have built up over time that basically is stuck kind of in your psyche and so therefore dominates in a way it shouldn't. Um, so it, it's interesting for, on the one hand that apparently quite esoteric practices um, are getting mainstream recognition. Um, but then... Um, in the explanation of these practices, um, often references made to subtle energies. So that's sort of one side of my raising this as a subject for discussion today. But then the other side is that quite often in discussion about subtle energies, your work is referenced, mm -hmm. morphogenetic fields. and But it feels to me like it's referenced um, in a way that might, might, could, be, could easily be accused of being hand wavy. Yes. Because at the, at the, at the same time, uh, quantum mechanics is referenced, and at the same time, chakras and meridians are referenced, um, and it all, and it can quite easily feel that anything that feels like it's got implicit energetic kind of qualities is being reached for without much understanding. Hmm. So I meet with you and talk regularly, so I thought you know I can help tease this out in my own mind as much as um, anyone else's. Well. Um... I agree with you. I think a lot of it is hand-waving. I think there are these methods like eye movement therapy and tapping therapy, you know, where people tap different parts yeah, of the Yeah, body. I mean, that's the practice I use myself. Yes, yeah. which seem to work. And I know there have been tests in, in America through the Veterans Administration hospitals through for treating post-traumatic stress disorder. And these therapeutic methods seem to work for a variety of, of, of conditions. Um, and I've spoken at conferences on so-called energy medicine in America and in Britain, where therapists have presented very impressive results. So I think the first thing is that the, these rather surprising therapies do really seem to work. And you know, possibly you could say they're enhancing a placebo effect or something like that, but the fact is placebo effects work. These therapies work. No one really knows how. Um, and, you know, in clinical trials, um, comparative effectiveness research can compare these therapies with other therapies, talking therapies or drugs or, um, and so on. And anyway, I, I take it that as established that these therapies do actually work. So, and lots of people are practicing them, and they're very cheap to do. I mean, tapping people or moving your finger in front of their eyes, and, I mean, this is not high-tech stuff. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require hundreds of thousands of pounds worth investment in, in MRI scanners or anything like that. Um, so I take it for, uh, as accepted that they work. They're cheap, they're effective, they could play a much bigger part in the medical system, in therapeutic systems. But I think the fact is no one knows how they work and therefore I think people do grasp for explanations, you know, and and the, often people bring in my own work as an explanation in a way that 
I just don't recognize as having any particular relevance to what I'm really doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I also receive requests quite often from people who are doing these therapeutic systems for me to endorse them in some way, saying, here's morphic resonance in action. Um, and again, I always say no, because I just don't know how they work. And um, th these therapies are attacked continually by so-called skeptics um, who've captured large areas of Wikipedia, for example, particularly to do with so-called energy medicine. Um, and in a way, it plays into their hands to put forward seemingly pseudo-scientific explanations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so then the question is, well, how do they work? You know, and um, I think that there are probably, you know, some perhaps more conventional explanations might be better. You know, the eye movement thing um, by making the eyes move uh, from left to right, there's a sense in which the different sides of the brain are being integrated. You you have to integrate the right and the left hemisphere to integrate these movements which move from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. And those could have an effect on changing actual nervous pathways which might influence memories of trauma. And in fact some people doing this work do suggest that's how it works. And if so, that's a, something that can be investigated through brain scans. Yeah, I mean, just picking up on that explanation, that certainly makes a lot of sense to me, um, because in the tapping, where you tap on parts of the body, um, work that's been written up by figures like Ian McGilchrist um, shows that the body is um, substantially more connected to the right hemisphere of the brain than it is to the left hemisphere of the brain. So stimulating different parts of the body um, whilst you're saying things um, that capture an experience or um, something that uh, has got stuck, um, that um, in, you know intuitively makes a kind of sense that rather than the more focused, tracked, um, uh, uh, you know, left hemisphere attention, um, which um, the the split brain research shows up, what you're doing when you're tapping the body is activating the more open-ended. Um, prepare a nest for something new side of the brain at the same time um, so doing the two things at once um, just puts someone in a slightly different consciousness than they're used to when they normally think about the trauma and rehearse it repeatedly you know without anything changing um, so that it can shift the experience and often when you do this at the very I mean it might be more than this I am open to more to, that it's more than this but at the very least there's a sense of a sort of space or newness. People can sort of see around the experience a bit more, um, and it you know it can be felt in the body. So the, at the very, at very least, that left-right attention that we have inside of us, um, bringing a bit more right attention in, rather than just a rather narrow, focused, trapped left attention, mm. um, you know, that thinks um, only one thing can happen and it happens again and again and again. That does make some sense. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think you see that the the. the I think the right and left hemisphere thing, um, I mean, one thing that I think everyone agrees is that the left hemisphere is controlling the right-hand side of the body in terms of muscular movements and, and vice versa. The right hemisphere is controlling the left side of the body, which is why if you have a stroke in the right hemisphere, the left side of your body is paralyzed um, or can be paralyzed. Um, so uh, there's... The, does the right and left sides of the body are concerned with you know the sensations and movements are lateralized in the brain which is not surprising what's surprising I'm mildly surprising is they cross over you might expect the left side of the brain would control the left side of the body well it doesn't it's the other way around but but then there's this other thing this somewhat more subtle thing that Ian McGilchrist talks about and many people did um, for years before him um, that the left side of the brain is more concerned with speech. Uh, and the speech areas are mainly in the left side of the brain, which is why you get aphasia, you can't speak if, or recognize words with a stroke in the left-hand side, whereas the right-hand side has more integrative functions. So there's, there's the speech, the thought, the integrative things are lateralized, but so are the body sensations and movements. Um, and those... The body things are more symmetrically lateralized. You know, the left-hand side of the... When you're walking, 
uh, you you have to coordinate the right and the left leg and if you're playing the piano you have to coordinate the right and the left hand or if you're doing anything really or driving a car you have to kill all of that is integrated through the right and left sides of the brain so tapping on different parts of the body will activate different sides of the brain and that may affect these more subtle psychological things fears thoughts uh, phobias etc um, so all that makes perfect sense to me but uh, it's all much more conventional this explanation yeah exactly the yeah, subtle yeah. energy explanation yeah and um, personally I'd prefer to start from a more conventional explanation rather than bring in quantum physics which personally I don't think it's got much to do with it um, uh, quantum physics is the science of the very very small and uh, it's about the way atomic processes happen and I don't think it's very, got very much to do with the brain or the activity of the body I mean yeah. there's hundreds of books about quantum societies quantum brains quantum medicine and all that kind of thing but I think they're using quantum as a metaphor rather than as a literal scientific explanation. Yeah, I mean, I do completely agree with that and feel that the, actually when you look at figures like Heisenberg or Bohr or um, other quantum physicists who are, you know, seminal to the development of quantum physics, they do make spiritual or, say, subtle esoteric sounding comments. But I think the reason why they did that is because they didn't understand the quantum physics um, so they reached for a spiritual perception which they did experience about unity or whatever it might be, rather than them seeing very clearly what the quantum physics meant and saying, ah, oh, this proves the spiritual perception. Um, so in a funny sort of way, when spiritually minded people reach for the quantum mechanics, they're getting it completely the wrong, wrong way around. They mm. should have the courage of their spiritual convictions, which is in fact what the quantum physics people um, like Heisenberg and the rest were, mm. were doing themselves they don't understand and it's still not it's still white, massively debated what the ontology of quantum physics is what it means um, about um, the nature of reality um, it, it works which is hence you get this expression amongst quantum physicists of just calculate you know mm. don't ask why just ask that um, uh, yeah so that, that that's the, for me that's the sort of bottom line with the kind of so-called quantum spirituality is that it's actually getting it the wrong way around it's reaching for the physics when actually the physicists were reaching for the spiritual perceptions and people should just yes. get on with the spiritual perceptions but I think the reasons one of the reasons they were doing that was because in order to understand what happens in quantum physics you have to take into account the role of the observer and that's actually not a very subtle point is that if you set up an experiment that measures waves then you detect waves and if you set up an experiment that detects particles like silver grains on a photographic film you detect particles you find what you're looking for in other words um, it, so that's not particularly strange it's true of any experiment any experiment measures a particular thing and you only find the kind of thing you, if you're looking for spectroscopic changes during a chemical uh, reaction and you're using a spectrometer you see spectroscopic changes if you're looking for heat changes you use a calorimeter you see heat changes so um, the kind of experiment you do determines the kind of results you get and so quantum physicists had to recognize that and then they said well it depends on the observer what the kind of observations you make and then people said, aha, depends on the observer, that means human consciousness. Human consciousness acts directly on the atom and the quantum particles. But actually, it doesn't mean that. It's, it's, well, it, in a sense it means that, but it's nothing like as mysterious as most people think. It's nothing more than the principle that Arthur Schopenhauer, the philosopher, pointed out at the beginning of the 19th century. All observations require an observer. You yeah. can't have an observation without an observer. And of course Schopenhauer was responding to Kant, and Kant had made the point that we take an enormous amount to our observing um, that, as it were, uh, shapes how we observe things as well. Yes. Um, so again, you know, our minds are already profoundly shaping everything that we observe, not just um, some kind of quantum interaction. Not just quantum theory. And you see, before that, the most scientists have perceived what's often called naive realism, the idea that the reality is totally objective out there and scientists just observe objective reality as if through a plate glass window not interfering with it 
a, a, an illusion that was uh, actually favoured by that scientific writing style. A test tube was taken. It was carefully smelled. You know, that kind of, the passive voice, uh, the scientific reports written in the passive voice gave the impression scientists just passively observed nature unfolding in front of them. And quantum physicists were some of the first to say, well, wait a minute, let's look at how we actually do experiments. But that applies to the whole of science, as Kant pointed out long ago, and as uh, everyone, I think, nowadays would recognize. Um, um, so I don't think there's anything particularly special about quantum th physics in that respect, nor special about the way it involves consciousness. So, as, as you say, I think that it's the wrong way around. Quantum physicists were reaching out to, to consciousness and more mystical senses of reality to try and deal with what was new in science, a, a kind of epistemological discussion about how do we know things, which actually philosophers had ground that they'd covered decades if not centuries before so look when i'm reading um uh people who do reach to your work to come a bit more to your work um morphic resonance um is a, a at least a starting point there to say that what you're interested in is the memory that's embedded in nature and um that when people um extend it sort of beyond that kind of habitual side of the natural world um, that, that then leads to form, to habit, behaviour and so on. Um, when it goes beyond that, then they're moving very much away from your work. Is that a kind of good starting point? Well, there's two sides to my work. One is that there's a kind of memory in nature and that, it's, that uh, much of nature works habitually, including us. I mean, our bodies uh, have habits and our minds have habits. Uh, everything about us has habits. We're creatures of habit. But I think the whole of nature is uh, based on habit. You know, instincts of animals are kind of collective habits of the species and the ways crystals form are kind of crystal habits. Um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is that these habits are expressed through fields morphic fields which organize systems in which the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So the morphic field of a crystal organizes the way in which the molecules fit together in a lattice structure. It's like a, a form of, of like almost an invisible blueprint of the crystal. And the morphogenetic fields, the form shaping fields of our bodies, which are one kind of morphic field, Morphic means form, so it covers a variety of fields, morphogenetic, that shape form, uh, behavioral fields that shape behavior, learning instincts, and so on, mental fields that shape mental activity, perceptual fields that shape perception, social fields that shape social groups. These are all species, as it were, of morphic field, which all have an inherent memory. But the morphogenetic fields that shape developing embryos, growing plants, and um, that shape form, link together the different parts of the body within an overall wholeness and relate them to each other. Now in that sense, morphogenetic fields underlie healing processes and regenerative processes. If you cut a flatworm into little bits, each little bit can grow into a new flatworm because it has a complete morphogenetic field for the whole flatworm. Rather like if you cut a magnet into little bits, each little bit is not a north pole or a south pole. It's a complete magnet with a north and south pole. It has a complete magnetic field. So the, there's a holistic quality to fields, not just morphogenetic fields, but electrical and magnetic fields. You can't slice up a magnetic field. The gravitational field of the Earth, for example, you can't take a slice out of that. It's a whole field or it's not a field at all. So there's a holistic property in all fields, and what I'm saying is that living organisms are organized by these fields which have a kind of memory. Now, this morphogenetic field underlies healing and regeneration, um, and in that sense they are involved in the healing of damage in plants and animals in all organisms, and they do have a major role to play in healing. Um, so certainly they're relevant to the healing process mm -hmm. and it's possible that certain types of therapy perhaps including tapping uh, 
would affect the way in which the field of the whole body is coordinated. Um, acupuncture may work through morphogenetic fields as well. The meridians may be ways in which different parts are linked up uh, over and above the way they're linked through nerves and blood vessels and so forth. So fields, in that case then, can have different, um, I don't know, have, have a kind of structure that will require yes. fields having a kind of structure they because do. you know meridians is about pathways through the body subtle yes. pathways um the chakras which are also referred to are about different zones in the body yes. that have different qualities um so morphogenetic fields can map onto that way of looking at things they too. do yes yeah. they do I, they, they certainly do map onto that way of looking at things and in that sense morphogenetic fields i think are relevant to understanding healing processes in general wound healing regeneration um, and uh, and may well be related to chakras and, and, and subtle body type phenomena meridians and so on uh -huh. um, so the, the when people invoke them in relation to healing processes is not completely inappropriate um, in fact in some cases it may be very appropriate but we don't really know uh, enough to say with any certainty how they work. So I myself, when it comes to these subtle energy medicines or holistic therapies, prefer to concentrate on evidence for the fact that it works or not, which I think is best done by comparative effectiveness research, comparing different therapies um, and seeing whether they work. Um, and leaving the question of how they work to you know to further research i mean very few people have actually done research on the relation between morphogenetic fields and these therapeutic systems it's speculative mm -hmm. um and you don't need to know how a therapy works for it to work i mean no one knew how aspirin worked as a drug even though it's not controversial that it's a drug and um, it was developed in the 19th century and has been um, one of the most popular drugs ever since but it wasn't until you know a couple of two or three decades ago that people worked out the molecular mechanism of aspirin and its effect on inf inflammation and so on. So, and no one knew how smallpox vaccine worked when it was widely practiced in the late 18th and 19th century. We discovered about the immune system later. No one knew how yeast worked in, in, in brewing or in baking of bread. I mean, people used ferments, you know, to, to raise bread and to brew beer for millennia before Pasteur discovered it, they were little organisms that could be killed by sterilization, etc. Um, so we don't need to understand how something works for it to work. And, but a lot of people feel for it to be scientific, they've got to give some kind of scientific sounding explanation. And I can understand why they feel that, because they're, uh, if they're accused of pseudoscience, then they feel they've got to make it sound scientific, and quantum theory makes it sound scientific. Yeah, I mean, I think the, a good, my normal riposte to that is you'd be surprised at how few drugs are actually understood in terms of the way they work. The vast majority are not understood at all. How do you understand, say, um, morphic fields in relation to, say, the soul or to spirit? Um, that side of, um, uh, well, you know, I take to be well, reality, trying to capture a side of reality itself. Well, this is a huge topic, obviously. Probably we can't deal with it now. But I, I think that the um, morphic fields, as I say, are patterns of organisation which are largely habitual. Um, and I think that there are many levels of organization. I think there are forms of consciousness beyond our own. You know, I think the whole Earth may be conscious, the Sun, the solar system, the galaxy, the cosmos. And then I think there's a form of consciousness beyond all that and underlying all nature, which I call God, some would call the absolute or the all or whatever. Um, so I, I, I think there, there's a difference between um, connecting consciously with the source of consciousness which is not about habit it's about being in the present it's an awareness in the present habits are usually unconscious so morphic resonance is largely about unconscious habits and it also makes it easier to do what's been done before easier to learn what others have already learned because it's habitual 
So there's a sense in which some spiritual practices have a morphic resonance component. Meditation, for example, mantras, rituals, um, tune in to previous practitioners. Um, going to holy places, um, you tune into the memory of those who've been there before. So there's a, a, an element of morphic resonance. But insofar as we're dealing with consciousness, being open to higher, more inclusive forms of consciousness, we're not talking about habit, we're talking about presence. And consciousness is experienced in, in the present. Um, so could you say that, because um, consciousness also involves things like will or desire, um, perception, um, these kind of qualities. Um, so could you say, for example, that if you um, do a meditation practice that is focusing say on attention and um, then you might become more attentive to what's going on at, um, at the less conscious more for resonance level of your being and so that if it becomes more conscious to you then you're able to relate to it more and perhaps shape it or um, you know untangle it in certain ways um, through meditation it, it's you might say it's will operating on a morphic field I think that's what yoga is largely about, actually. I think, you know, these Indian yogis who uh, uh, can uh, achieve feats of control of their digestive system, their heartbeat, well, people can do it through bi biofeedback as well, um, uh, is to do with uh, a conscious relationship to processes that are normally unconscious. We have the whole autonomic nervous system which goes on unconsciously within us, uh, controlling our breathing, our heartbeat, the, co the contractions of our guts, you know, affecting our immune system and so on. We're totally unconscious of most of that. Um, and, you know, it, it can be modulated up and down by our overall conscious state through the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Um, I think what yogis do is, uh, you know, through the, the, the point where these systems overlap is mainly through breathing. And by concentrating on breathing, uh, you can actually modulate these internal, usually unconscious systems. And I think that breathing is probably the key to a conscious awareness of them. And therefore, meditation and attention can play a part there. Mm -hmm. But I think that the healing effects of spiritual practices are often to do with the fact that they make us feel more connected to a larger whole. And that greater sense of connection seems to have a healing effect. So that would be a, a, um, a perception rather than, say, shifting a bad habit? Well, it might help in shifting a bad habit, because uh -huh. some bad habits are to do with fear and insecurity, and, and if we feel more connected, we feel more secure, more relaxed, more protected. So it might relax something that's got entangled in a morphic field in your body somewhere? Yes, uh, some habit of, of defensiveness, habit of fear, habit of, uh, you know, vigilance, a hypervigilance or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think that, I mean, but this is why taking us into a different area, really, from tapping therapy. Well, not that different, but it's somewhat different from where we started with subtle energies. Um, and, yeah. And, you know, the, the subtle energy... I think is not necessarily a very good word for the kind of things we've been talking about. It's an attempt, again, to put a scientific word, energy, um, I a, as an explanation uh, in a way that most scientists wouldn't recognize, so it's called subtle energy. And to what degree this is a valid use of the word energy, I don't know. Energy is defined in science as the capacity for doing work. It's something to do with activity or movement. Um, and one could say that there's a healing movement in, in the, from the therapist to the client in a subtle energy practice, that there is a, some kind of flow of energy. But again, I don't think we really understand any of these yeah. things. Yeah, no, my experience of tapping is much more to do with awareness than it is to do with the transference of energy or, or doing work. Um, if anything, it's the opposite of work, because it's a kind of contemplation, actually. Um, it's precisely not trying to do something. It's trying to open up to what might be there. And I think that um, for reasons that aren't understood, as you're very clearly saying, but nonetheless, it seems that by tapping 
in the first instance on the body opens up an awareness but then with the extra nuance i think tapping on different parts of the body opens up different kinds of awareness yes. which again perhaps isn't so surprising because your hands have a certain kind of feel from say your torso um you know that you that that, that seems quite intuitively so so different parts of your body are already associated with different kinds of awareness. You know, you think in your head, but where maybe you sort of feel your way forward through your heart or your chest, and then you feel anxiety in your gut. Yes. You know, that, 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 that's, that, that's clearly the case. Um, so, yeah, I, I suppose I feel that, again, it's worth just kind of doing a bit of work, expending a bit of energy on trying to tease these things apart. Because I guess at the end of the day, my motivation is, you know, I, I completely agree that these techniques work and there's good evidence that they do um, and we actually do ourselves a disservice when we too quickly reach for this that and the other to try and give it a kind of pseudoscientific gloss mm. it's much better to stand back um, and to really allow um, you know what might be really a very different thing to emerge and show itself um, rather than sort of short circuiting it too quickly totally agree I think these are whole areas where the research hasn't really begun I mean the funding for research is nearly all on things like molecular medicine. It, it ignores these areas. People who practice them are practicing but not doing the research. And I think that this is a huge new area for genuine scientific research. Um, and we can't prejudge the outcome of it because we actually don't understand these things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's better to admit that, um, but actually to and, and to concentrate the research to start with on, you know, the question of. How do they work? How well they work? Do they work? If so, how well do they work? And under what conditions do they work best? A completely pragmatic approach, I think, has to come first. Yeah, well, thank you very much. So I'm going to take away, resist the rush to explain, and stay with developing the experience that actually makes a difference at the end of the day. So thank you. Good. Thank you, Mark.